the one skill that you have to learn and this was that this changed my life again this this one little thing i used to get in a lot of trouble when i was younger and i basically had an automaton from my, from my mum go and work with your dad or you can get out and i can remember this just daunting fear came over me like but I was working all of the hours under the sun. My relationship was a mess. And like everyone was telling me I was mad. My dad tried to talk me out of it because he worked there. Genuinely coming from a place of love. He was like, mate, you shouldn't do this. My nan and granddad actually cried when I told them because they were genuinely petrified. To me, it was just insanity. It's a very, very lonely place. You've got to get used to the odds being against you. You've got to get used to uh, lots of people around you thinking you're crazy. When someone clicks on an ad, there's already intent there. There's a reason that they clicked. But then now they've landed on the page, your job, your job now has to be Matt, thank you so much for being here. I want to dive straight into just learning a little bit about your story. And as I was researching, I heard that you started out basically building Andy Harrington, who's a motivational speaker. You sort of was a huge part in building his business. I want to hear yeah. a little bit about like that experience, what that taught you, and essentially how that led to Einstein Marketer being born. Yeah, man. Well, f first of all, thanks for having me, Matt. Appreciate it. I, was, uh, I didn't, didn't actually know it was going to be live, but I knew all these people were going to be able to dumb me air or something. <laughs> it's very stuck a little bit. Um, but yeah, yeah, man. Um, you know, I've been, I've been in marketing now for a long time, probably like 50, getting on 15 years now. I started, uh, you know, my journey started like way back when, you know, I had kids very, very young to start with. I've got three kids now. One's about to turn 16. So by the time I was 24, I had three kids. I used to work in a factory and that's when I started sort of like learning all this sort of stuff, you know, learning about personal development and all of that sort of stuff. Cause I was, I was in a factory and uh, I worked to my old man there. I used to get in a lot of trouble when I was younger. I basically had an automaton from my, from my mum, go and work for your dad, go and work with your dad or you can get out. And obviously at that time I was living at my mum's with my son. So I had me, my son and my, my now wife, we were living at my mum's. So I had to go and work with my dad and, it was a great experience because I got to sort of like learn a lot from my dad, learn a lot about, you know, working hard and all that sort of stuff. But one thing which was like uh, a bit scary <clears throat> was these, these, these guys that worked in this factory, most of them were like proper old guys. You know, to me, I was like 20 and these guys are like in their 50s, 60s and all of them every single day would just moan about the place you know this place that this place that oh and a bus and and all of this sort of stuff and i can remember to this day vividly it was like like it was yesterday i asked one of them i was like how long have you been here just out of curiosity and he looked at me and he said 35 years and i can remember this just daunting fear came over me like mm. fuck you know I've, i can't end up in this smoking booth in 35 years, still moaning about this place and not doing anything about it. To me, it was just insanity. But it was really, really good because that was a defining moment in my life. It made me realize that I didn't want to be there forever. And it made me sort of like open my eyes and start looking for other opportunities. And that's when I started listening to personal development stuff. You know, you know, me, I'm from Gravesend. Like, you know, we're, we're it's a like working class town. No one knows about money, you know, running businesses, none of that sort of stuff. You, you know, what was on my cards was, you know, yeah, construction at best, you know, it's what I could have done, which I did a lot when I was younger. But no one ever, no one ever talks about this sort of stuff. So when I started reading about, you know, business and money and listening to Tony Robbins and all that sort of stuff, it just inspired me. And I was like, well, this is what I'm going to do now. I'm just going to, you know, follow it through. And I can remember... In in the factory, we had to, we had to, we used to have to wear uh, we used to have to wear earplugs because it's very very noisy. And if you got caught without your earplugs on, you'd get proper bollocks by the by the foreman. If he come round and saw you, you yeah. know you'd you'd get a proper spanking if you didn't have your earplugs in. But all of this time, there were twelve hour shifts we used to work. I just wanted to learn while I was running doing all this stuff at the factory. I wanted to just fill my mind with as much information as I could. So what I did was the earplugs that we used to have to wear were orange and blue. And I painted my <laughs> uh, my Apple my i my what 
what was it called? iPods, wasn't it? And iPods at the time. IPods, I had yeah, iPods. Yeah, back then. I had an iPod with my Tony Robbins and my Brian Tracy and all that sort of stuff on it. And it took me fucking hours. Sorry, I'm, I'm allowed to swear. Sorry. You've done it. Swear. You've done it. We've gone. I've done it We've now. Gone so, it. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah. Um, and I was, and it took me hours to paint these um, earplugs, like b- blue and orange, all of them. So when the foreman walked past, he thought I had my earplugs in, and I'm listening to Tony Robbins, you know, at my factory, at the fa- my factory desk, and all this sort of stuff. And um, really, really strange. But my my Einstein branding, and I, I only daunted on this. I was actually on a, another podcast about a year back, and I mentioned, and I told this story, and then it hit me. I was like, bloody hell, that's my. My brand is orange and blue. Your brand colour, yeah, yeah, yeah. All my, my Einstein brand, my EMC, my event, it's all orange and blue. And I was just wondering, I wonder if that was a that was a little thing. So anyway, after th- at that point, I knew I had to do something, you know, different with my life. And I knew, you know, I had to get into the world of money and making money and business. And I kept reading over and over and over again. I was listening to Branson said it, Robin said it, loads of these other guys that I was listening to and reading said it. They said one the one skill that you have to learn if you're ever going to be wealthy, you know, or successful in business anyway, you've got to learn how to sell. And this kept coming up, like selling kept coming up, kept coming up. And it got to a point where I was like, right, I think my next step, my next stage should be sales, sales. I want to get that mastered. So I then started like consuming loads of sales material, reading it, and I managed to get myself a job in the city as an investment broker. So we were selling investments over the phone. Brutal cold calling, like this cold calling environment. Uh, you might have seen the film like Boiler Room or Wolf of Wall Street. That type of environment is, is what I used to work in when I was like in my early 20s. Very, very high pressure. You know, y- your shoes have to be polished. Your, your tie's got to be perfect. It's got to be tied in a double wind or not, or you get fined and all this sort of stuff. And I got an opportunity to go and work at this place really good opportunity for commission but very low basic so it was a 12 grand basic job and at that time i was working all of the hours under the sun my relationship was a mess because i was ne- i was working all the overtime because it was only me emily wasn't working but the year that i left i was i earned 36000 pounds now for someone from where i'm from that's actually a lot of money like i was making way more money than any of my mates and uh, and um it was a very, very scary thing to do to leave that, the comfort of that, to a 12 grand basic job where it's just a chance you do well based on your yeah. performance. Yeah. And like everyone was telling me I was mad. My dad tried to talk me out of it because he worked there. Genuinely, coming from a place of love, he was like, mate, you shouldn't do this. this is really, you've got a mortgage now. Um, you've got a kid. You can't be doing this. Like the boss obviously t- said the same thing. My nan and granddad, no joke, my nan and granddad actually cried when I told them. <laughs> wow, actually wow. cried i was like bloody hell what are you getting so worked up for they cried because they were genuinely petrified that i'm going all they saw was 36 down to 12 but i said i said yeah but i could make way more i could make 50 70 80 grand at this job in the first year yeah but you might not and um luckily i didn't listen to them and i went to work in in, in the city in this job and I did very, very well straight away. I broke all the records, you know, because I had to. I had to make it work. There was no doubt. I had to make it work. Plus, I'd studied a load. And then when I got there, we're calling. We're literally day, every single day. We have to make 200 calls. We have to spend at least two hours on the phone. And the, the people we're calling are just, they haven't got a clue who we are. They're telling us to fuck off, you know, on the phone. They're calling us all the names under the sun. And I went, one day, I'd been there about eight months. And I went to the, the manager and I said to him, Mate, how much like because I heard they pay for leads, which which I thought was crazy. I was like, how much do you pay for these 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 leads? And they said well, each name on that sheet's probably about fifteen quid. And I was like, and bearing in mind we're calling thousands of these a day, and I'm working out, I'm like fifteen pound for this lead. Yeah, I was like, this is mental. Like they haven't got a clue. The the, the qualification was, do they have an ISA? I think that was it. If they had an ISA, which means they might have a couple of grand in savings, they were on our list, and we're we're trying to sell them investments and. It was just bonkers to me. So then my mind got sort of worked up again and I started then went down another rabbit hole of marketing and I started researching marketing, lead generation and all this stuff. And I literally had no idea about it at the time. Back then, you know, it was only Google. Google was it. That was it. So you had search on Google and that was it. And I started studying and learning about Google ads to a point where I thought I understood it enough to at least give it a go. And I approached my manager there and said, look, bro, you know, however much you spend, they're spending 50, 100 grand a, a month on these leads. I said, look, why don't you just give me a grand to test this? 
because I think I can get you a much better quality lead um, that, that where they actually give us their information. So they're mm. actually expecting our phone call. And he let me do it. Thank God he did as well, because this sort of, this was that, this changed my life again, this, this one little thing, because I did it, sure enough, spent a thousand pounds. I generated them uh, about 250 leads. It was roughly like a five pound a lead. And, you know, every single one of them was receptive. We yeah. suddenly had people that wanted to speak to us. And I think from that grand, they made like near, nearly a hundred grand just from that thousand pounds I spent. It, it pretty much impossible nowadays, especially from Google, because it's that expensive, but it, was just, it just blew their mind. And I ended up running all of their ads and running their marketing. So then I left sales and sort of went into marketing. And then um, obviously I then had another kid on the way. I decided to take a step back from the city because the city was just getting to me. It was a very, very high pressure job lots of travel, you know, lots of time away from the family. And we ju again, we've just had our second kid and um, I wanted something a little bit closer to home. So I started researching marketing roles. And that's when I came across an ad from uh, the guy you mentioned, Andy Harrington. And this, it just at pure chance, this was, he lived two roads away from me. Wow. Like I lived here, two roads down is where he lived. Wow. It was like, it was crazy. I could have threw a stone and hit his house and he was advertising for this job. And realized that he was involved in like events and all of these guys that I'm actually been learning from. So for me, it was well exciting because I was like, I've been studying these guys, Robbins and all of these guys for years. He's met them. He's, he's spoke on stage with them. And I was like, it's an amazing opportunity to go and, um, you know, pursue a career in marketing. So I started, um, I started working for him as a marketing manager and, um, you know, he was doing high six figures at the time. I was with him for about five years and, you know, helped him grow that company to, you know, a uh, 10, 10 plus million pound company within that time. I ended up being the managing director of that for a couple of years. And then, um, and then I broke off and, and started Einstein Marketer. That's one like of the things, story. one of the things <laughs> I want to, yeah, but really fascinating. And I just want to touch upon, because I know I speak to a lot of people that they find this this path, if you want to call it that, of personal development can be quite lonely. And, you, and one of the things you said there about, you know, pretty humble beginnings, nobody else around you was in this world of focusing on business, sales, personal development. I know a lot of people struggle with that because they're like, I listen to the podcast, I listen to the audio books, it makes sense. But then I've got nobody supporting me around me that gets it. And I just feel totally on my own for you. How did you overcome that? Was it just this did you always just have this unwavering belief in yourself that you didn't need validation or support or, or, you know, what did you do? Yeah. I mean, I'm very, very lucky in the sense that, you know, I've always had a, 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 a sort of unwavering confidence and, and that all comes from my parents. You know, I, 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 I always tell people, I say, I don't believe in luck at, at all, but there's one thing that you can't deny. We are very, very lucky or unlucky in, and that's, the family we're born into that's literally yeah. like a yeah, it's, yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a one in a 10 million chance of you being born into the family you're in I, I was born into a family although we didn't have much my mum and dad just loved me unconditionally I was always told from very very young as, as long as I can remember I was told how gorgeous I was how beautiful I was now I'm older now and and, and I ain't stupid right I know I ain't that good looking but <laughs> I think I am. This is the difference. I know the reality is I'm not, but I think I am, you know, because I was always told it from a very, very young age. And that, that really, really gave me this confidence. I could go, I could do stuff um, growing up naturally because I had that, that was literally conditioned into me from such a young age that you can do whatever you want. You can be whoever you want to be. Uh, you're amazing. You're great. You're this, you're that. I was told this all of the time. So that, that gave me a bit of confidence and mm. definitely backed, backed me up and allowed me to believe in myself when other people wouldn't. But one thing I will say, especially for those guys that are, you know, getting out in business or, you know, looking to be an entrepreneur, it, you've got to get used to that because being an entrepreneur and being a business owner is a very lonely place anyway. So if you can't, if you can't cut it when you're just starting out and you're surrounded by people that, don't understand you, don't believe in you. There's no way that you'll be able to carry on because it never gets easier. 
it's not like when you've suddenly got a job and all of this sort of stuff, suddenly everyone believes in you. It's not the case. It's a very, very lonely place, you know, being an entrepreneur. So you've almost got to get used to that. You've got to get used to the odds being against you. You've got to get used to uh, lots of people around you thinking you're crazy and you're mental and you're never going to do things. It's, it's just all part and, part and parcel of the game, you know? So if somebody's watching this now and they're relatively new to business, in your experience, what's what's kind of the advice you'd give to somebody with regards to when they should actually start thinking about investing in ad spend? Because I know there's a lot of people that have maybe just been doing things organically on social media and they're kind of like, they're earning an okay amount of money, but they're scared. Like, will it be a bottomless pit if I'm investing in ads? There's other people who come to business and go straight away, I'm just going to plow all my budget into ads. Generally speaking, what's the advice you'd give about when to spend money on ads? Well, yeah, because I mean, for, you know, I run a marketing agency. So I understand marketing. We're a digital marketing agency. So we run paid ad campaigns for everyone. We, we manage, you know, anywhere from sort of seven to nine hundred thousand pounds a month on ad spend. That's how much we're spending as an agency. And, wow. you know, we, 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 we see this all of the time. We, you know, we get lots of people approach us because of our, you know, because of our blogs and the stuff we do online that want to come and you know, do some work with us. So, yeah, we want to spend some money on ads. You know, can you help us do it? And the first thing that we ask them is, have you got an offer that's already proven? Have you already proven that this does sell? So are, are people already buying it? Because that's the first thing to know. But, but you've got to try to find an offer that works as little risk, as, especially when you're first starting out, with as little risk as possible. So the easiest way to do that is organic stuff. It's obviously referrals. They just sort of come naturally. Most people that come to us, they're, 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 oh yeah, I've just referrals, you know, and all this sort of stuff. But if you've got something that people are buying and it's working, then there's a very, very good chance you can replicate that online and just increase the amount of people that are doing that just by running paid ads. So number one would be, is the offer proven? Does it work? Does it convert? Have you tested it actually online? It's not all offline, for example. Um, and then, and then, yeah, once you've got that, it's a case of testing it very, very small. Always test small. Lots of people think they're going to spend money on ads. It's going to cost tens of thousands or thousands or hundreds of thousands or whatever. But it's not. You could literally test to see if something works for a couple of hundred quid, you know, to see if it's going to work. And then from there to very, very strategically test and tweak what, what you're doing so that you can make it work at a much better level. What are some of the common mistakes you think people make when it comes to their approach with their ad campaigns so number one is always the funnel you know where people are sending that traffic to um <clears throat> you know i sort of that that's sort of my bread and butter really the funnel side of things that's what i used to do with, for andy more than anything was design the funnel you know those two awards there are for funnels that i've built that have done over a million dollars in revenue um, wow, that's a mate. Congratulations. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, I got them from ClickFunnels. They're really, really cool, really cool. It's a really cool company, and I do a lot of stuff with those guys. But yeah. the number one, the number one reason is always the funnel. It's never the ads. It, it, like one percent of the time it's the ads. Well, if we if someone comes to us and they're already doing something, it's not working, and the mistake that they made isn't the ads. The ads are normally fine. It's what happens when they land on that page because you've got to think of it um, in a very scientific way. Like when, when, for instance, when someone clicks on an ad, there's already intent there. There's a reason that they clicked, but then now they've landed on the page. Your job, your job now has to be to capture them um, at the highest rate of possible. And what I mean by that is rather than just sending them to a page where you are making them an offer to buy something straight away, you know, that's like the old age example is that's like walking up to a, a girl in the bar and asking them to marry you, you know, straight away. Yeah, it doesn't normally go down well. It's like it's a bit weird, you know. It's a no. bit too fast. But you know, you you would never do that. Your, your reality is, if you've got any game whatsoever, you'd walk up, you say hello first of all, what's your name, tell them your name, ask them what they do, how they are, do they want a drink, blah blah blah, what's their number, maybe. And it's a longer process. And then what lots of people do online is they forget that and they just try to they send people to a page and they hope that the the the, the people are going to buy straight away. Now, there's a big problem with it, especially when you're starting out and you've, you're a small business and you haven't got much budget. First problem is that you're only, even if someone does buy it, which is rare, 
you're only getting the buyers. Mm. And like, you know, I've been in this game a long time and there's three different, there's three different types of people in any market. You've got your hyperactive, low hanging fruit buyers, right? And that makes up 20% of any market. I sit in that bracket. I'll buy anything. Yeah, I'm it's the same. The I'm, I'm there with you in that bracket, definitely. Yeah, it's it's one of the reasons why I'm a good marketer because I, I'll just I'll just buy everything, so I know what makes people buy because I'm just really really easy to sell to. Yeah. Land on a page, you can make a decision. Don't need to think about it. Bosh, you're done. Yeah. The biggest part of the market, the biggest part of any market, is about seventy percent, sixty to seventy percent of any market is your considerate buyers. These are the guys that need to think it over. They need to do a bit of research. They need to go away, check out reviews, maybe check out competitors, sit on it, mull it over, think about it. Now, this makes up the biggest, most valuable part of any market. Now, the problem is if you're just, just trying to sell to people straight off the bat, you're missing out on this. You're missing out on three quarters of your market because you're only going after the people that are just ready to buy. And the other 10 to 20 percent and they're just never going to buy anything from you anyway you know so what happens is we send people to a site and try to get them to buy something and we're missing out on loads of people also it's very very hard to get someone to make a buying decision straight away as well what we should do is what we should do first of all if we're going to spend money sending people somewhere we should at least try to capture their contact information we should at least try to um get their name and email address maybe a phone number so that if they don't buy, we can follow up with them later on. We do this with things called lead magnets. You know the game. We, do, we, we offer something for free. Information normally is great in the form of something downloadable so it doesn't cost you anything that they can get. But what you do, what, what's really going on with this when you're offering a lead magnet or something for free, what you're really doing is you're getting them to hold their hand up and say they're interested. So for example, if I am an, an accountant, and my site, I'm giving um, away something, again, like a lead magnet. I'm giving that away in exchange for their information. I want to know that they're going to buy eventually. So my, the name of the lead magnet that I have has got to be, it's got to qualify them. So for example, a really good name for a lead magnet, if I was an accountant, would be five ways to save money on your tax return. Yep. A business owner's guide. Now, something like that. Because what they're, what they're inadvertently telling you by downloading that is they're looking to save money on their tax return. So first of all, tax return, good, because that's your clientele. There's no point an accountant generating a list full of employees. They just, he'd never be able to help them. Yep, exactly. So it's a good qualifier. So now he knows that they might buy at some point. And then once, they've, once he's got them, the, the next page, the next page is where you can try to sell to them because you've already got them on your list. What this means is if no one buys and you've spent a hundred pounds on ads, at least you've got 50 leads that are on your list that you can follow up and nurture with, nurture over time, send them emails, send them more content, send them more offers, send them promotions, call them up potentially, get your team to call them up or whatever. So it's a more efficient way of spending money. And that's what a lot of people don't do. They spend their money or they, sorry, they waste their money um, on ads and then they say advertising paid advertising doesn't work it's not right it's just the strategy that you use was wrong because if you can spend your money in an efficient way so rather than spending a hundred pound and getting one customer you spend a hundred pound get one customer but 49 other people on your list that might buy later yeah, yeah that's yeah. a way more efficient use of your money you know so um when, yeah, when it that's comes a, that's to... a big mistake when it comes to the actual ad side, I know you said there it's more the funnel and I guess people wanting to sell prematurely. That, that's two great pieces of advice. What about the actual ads itself? What are, because one of the things I noticed you've done recently is quite like long form adverse. I've seen the advert mm -hmm. where you're tied up in the back of a car. Um, yeah. And, and an another one um, I think that you did that was really high quality. Was it about five, six minutes? It could have been um, yeah. for EMC. Mm -hmm. Um Generally, in this world of social media where people are watching stuff for three seconds and going to the next, going to the next, one would think that seems a bad idea. So what's kind of some of the tips there with the length and the, the type of adverts? Yeah, it depends on what platform. But it, it, we, you were speaking there about Facebook. So let's talk about Facebook. So Facebook, obviously, is still, you know, a Goliath in the advertising world. It's where pretty much everyone still is. 
you know, at the moment, lots of attention still on that platform. So what's good about it from an advertising point of view is that video, first of all, from like a newbie or someone that hasn't advertised before, video isn't necessarily the best media on that platform. Image ads still to this day outperform video ads all the time for all of our clients, which is great. It's great news for people that don't want to do video, first yeah, of all. Of uh, in terms of the video, actually, I'll get to the video in a second. There's free, there's a free step process that we follow here at uh, Einstein Marketing when we're creating any ad for any client. Free steps. And if you follow these free steps and you do these free steps in order, you're, you're, oh, if you're running ads right now, guarantee, guarantee you'll see an increase in your click-through rate. Step one is you've got to stop the scroll. Like when people go and create ads, the first thing they think about is the copy and they think about what the video, what am I going to say in the video? Where's the video going to be shot and all this sort of stuff. Forget all of that. The first point of focus has to be how do we get someone to stop scrolling? Yeah. Because on Facebook, that is what they're doing. So they're scrolling through Facebook, either on their phone like this or in their mouse, and they're clicking down and they're scrolling down the page. And a lot of the time, it's very, very subtle subconscious stuff that gets them to stop scrolling. So you've got to first, there's, they're never going to read the copy or click on the link if they don't stop scrolling. So unless you do that first, the, the, everything else is a waste of time. And when you think about it like that, 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 that opens up your mind to different questions. Okay, so what type of image? It doesn't have to relate to the product now, but what type of image is going to stop the scroll? Here's a little tip. When you're next on Facebook uh, and you're scrolling on your phone or whatever, if something does stop you scrolling, whether that's an ad or just a friend's post or an image of some sort, if anything stops you scrolling, I want you to think that there's money in that. And I want you to save it. You can go to top, top right, the three dots, save that and create folders. I've got thousands and thousands and thousands of ads that I've saved because they've stopped me scrolling. Because next time you come to create an ad, you'll have all of this stuff to go, oh, that's, that stopped me scrolling. Um, I wonder why. Can I find an image that's like that so that it can do the same? I did this for an eye once. There was a, I was scrolling through and this eye, this woman's eye, beautiful eye. And it was just an eyeball, but like, obviously the pitch was very, very clean and cut. She had long eyelashes and her eye was beautiful. And it just stopped me scrolling. I don't know why. I was just mesmerized by it. And it, so I saved it. And then weeks later, maybe even months later, when we were doing a campaign for a lead magnet that we were running ourselves, I went through my folders and I saw this eye and I was like, oh yeah, that stopped me scrolling. So I went straight onto iStock photo or, you know, Shutterstock or whatever photo thing you use. And I just searched for woman's eye. And then all of these photos come up and I just went through and I just picked a load of eyes that I thought would work. And I just used them as an image and sure enough, crazy high click through rates and really cheap leads. So that's step one, stop the scroll. Step two, now you've stopped the scroll, and this is really going to annoy you now I've told you this. What happens, what happens on Facebook when you stop scroll, when something stops you scrolling without any control, conscious control whatsoever, your eye immediately goes down very slightly. And now I've told you you're going to be conscious of it and you're going to hate me because it's very annoying. Yeah. It, it, it stops you scrolling, and then without any control, your eye goes down, which is where the headline is. Have you ever asked yourself why headlines in Facebook are below the image? When, ha when, when headlines throughout time, throughout human history, have yeah. always been at the top. Newspapers yeah. at the top. Billboards at the top. Loads, every headline's always at the top. Google ads at the top. But Facebooks are below. Really strange. It's because you're, because you're scrolling down like this. Your eyes conditioned to do this and then down, this and then down. That's why Facebook did it 10 years ago when they changed headlines from the top to the bottom. They realized no one was looking at the headline because once the scroll stopped, they then look at the headline. So step two is you've got to write a headline now that makes them want to read the copy. Mm, mm. Very important difference. So not a headline to make them click to buy, nothing. You, 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 the, the headline's goal is to make them read more. That's it. Same with, a, same with a headline on a sales page or on a, in a newspaper. The headline's job is to get them to read more, not to get them to act. That's the job of your copy. So now you write a headline. And one word you should always keep in mind when writing headlines is intrigue. Mm. Intrigue is a very powerful word for headlines. Get them curious. You almost want them sort of pulling this face when they do it. Like, what's that mean? What's it mean by that? Because then what happens if you do that, 
if you can get that intrigue and make them pull that little face mentally, again, without any conscious control, and you're going to hate this, you then your eye then goes up because you're intrigued and you want to learn more. And you look to the top of the post because you know up there is related to the post you're reading. So now your eye goes up and now you're reading the copy. So then when you press on see more, now they're into the copy. And that's where you've got to now step three is write copy that makes them click. Not buy, not opt in, just sell the click. Because every marketing is psychology. And what we have to do is we have to do it step by step. Stop them scrolling to make them read the headline. Write a headline that makes them read the copy. Write copy that makes them click. Then when they click, it's your landing page's job to do whatever it is you're trying to do. Capture that lead, sell that product, book a call, you know, whatever it is you're trying to do. That's the job of your site. That's the job of that over there. That's why the funnel is so important. Um, so, yeah, I, don't, I can't even remember what you originally asked me. Sorry, I've gone on a rant. Well, no, that was, <laughs> I'm sure everyone will agree, that was absolute gold. What about video then? We spoke about the the long, mm. you just said there like video is not as yeah. effective as picture, but then I'm seeing you invest in loads of money in long form video. So I'm intrigued by that. Well, so yes, I, 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 didn't, I didn't say that. What I said was uh, uh, images very often will outperform video. So if video is yeah, done okay. well, don't, don't get me wrong. If video is done well, um, it is very powerful. Now, you know, I do occasionally do, you know, video ads and stuff like that and the one that you're referring to funnily enough didn't actually cost i think it cost like 400 pounds it looked high budget but it wasn't it was pretty much all shot in different parts of my office and uh we did something different for that ad now what i think is that i was thinking about events because it was just to fill up my event and i was thinking you know do i just do what i normally do and what lots of other people do and just stand in front of the camera and do something people just know that's an ad so what I want to try to do again, stop the scroll. So I've got to grab some attention. So again, it's me walking through the office with some words coming up and then really, really closely. I'm in a fridge shivering, you know, things like that to grab a bit of attention. And what I decided to do with that longer form one was basically just test engaging them first in a story before even mentioning the event. So if you watch that, ad, that ad's actually killed it. That one's done better than the one of me locked in the booth. And that's longer. And the reason is, is because it, it engages them in the story and it makes them watch it because it's quite fast paced. There's lots of scene changes. There's words coming up and it's like this. And obviously it's quite, some of them are quite engaging and funny. And there's, then there's comedy in it, very important. Um, it, it gets them hooked in the story. So before they know it, they're watching this and they're, they're involved in it now. They're, they're, they're sort of watching it for 30 seconds, a minute which means now their mind's open for me to go whack, there's EMC, come to my event. And that was the whole you know, idea behind that event. It was getting them engaged in a story so that they're ready to receive the message rather than me saying, opening up about my event so that they straight away go, fuck off, you know, because that's what happens a lot of the time. If you, again, if you go in a bit too early, straight away bullshit filter goes up in their head and they just won't let any message come in at all, even if it's a good one. So what I try to do is subtly, you know, open their mind up a little bit, get them engaged. And even people that aren't even interested in the event are commenting on it. You might send like a comment on it. It's one of the best ads I've ever seen. I never watch ads, but I watch this whole thing. Yeah. And it's because you engaged them in the story. So I think that's a really important thing yeah. because I do see it in comments. People are tired of ads. A lot of people are saying, stop showing me ads. I've seen that, those kind of comments. And I'm interested, is there anything, I know a lot of people have spoke about, you know, Facebook ads in particular, it's changed over the years in terms of it's not as easy now, there's new challenges. How do you perceive that? Is there information and advice you give today that was very different to 18 months ago? Has there had to be a shift in how you look at adverts? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we're always changing what we do and evolving because we just learn so much because again, we, you know, we spend a lot of money on ads every single month. So we sort of, you know, we learn, we, we learn pretty quick about what's changing and we are always testing new stuff and then we're just rolling out what's working. And again, the biggest shift with video, especially images, I don't think anything's changed. I think it's as easy now as it was five years ago to get an image ad up and get that working and generating some leads. But with video and things like that, especially, especially if you're in some sort of space where you're positioning yourself as an expert of some sort or you're positioning yeah. yourself as a, uh, you know, a thought leader or someone like that, 
immediately you're already going to get sort of some negativity there anyway. Yeah. So you've just got to be a little bit more, what's the word? A little bit more strategic in the way that you approach mm. it, I think. Mm. Um, like you said, it's kind of like finding ways to get their guard down, right? And and yeah, get them exactly. away from and, that you know, salesy feeling that they get a lot of people. Yeah, and I, you know, I think you know, I've found the best. The, again, this is just me personally. I've found the best way to do that is a bit of com- bit of comedy in it. You know, just yeah. take the piss out of yourself a little bit. <laughs> I think that sort of helps. Um, but you can again with with that though. You, if you're going to do ads, especially if you're going to do videos, you've got to first just absolutely not care what people are going to say because no matter what, you're going to get people commenting on your ads. You know, if you see if you've got any of you guys see any of my ads, just read the comments. You'll see like. You know, there's there's some there's some silly comments in there. I just have fun with them because at the end of the day, every comment helps you gets more reach and more engagement. And also, I've got to say Facebook. that is, I think, I've really noticed that's a great technique that some businesses are using is to have kind of a bit of banter back with the negativity. It gets so much respect from other people watching it. And I think I've seen it even where sometimes the person who was like, quote unquote, trolling or you know, just kind of being negative, I guess has then kind yeah. of come back with a bit of like fair play to the response. So I think how you respond to that can actually be really beneficial, right? Oh, it's massive. Yeah. I mean, I've had that many times. I'm actually quite well known for it about, you know, <laughs> I, I, I literally just reply with just outrageous love and banter to this person because at the end of the day, they're just having a bad day. None of it's actually aimed at you. It's just all their yeah, reflection yeah. of themselves and the shit that they're going through, you know? Yeah. So just have a bit of fun with it and reply and and there's been so many times where the guy's now gone, like he's literally come back and he's been like, Matt, you've turned me. I'm actually a fan <laughs> now. That that response that response has made me fall in love with you, blah, 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 you know. And yeah. it happens all of the time. Yeah. But you, my most important thing from an advertising point of view is don't let that stuff stop you or get you down yeah. or slow you down because no matter what platform, no matter what the ad, you could literally be giving away a million pounds genuinely and you're gonna get haters on that ad. You know, and, and you, you so it doesn't matter you know so you mentioned your event emc entrepreneurs um marketing conference i was there last year and I, i'm gonna say this now hands down one of the best events i've been to um at the time of recording i think it's your third year running this right that's yeah next week. third year yeah yeah uh, i cannot year. wait to be there um for those who have no idea what it is do you want to just talk a little bit about what the premise is for that event uh, yes, yeah, the Entrepreneurs Marketing Conference. So um, I uh, I used to go to an event every year in the States called Traffic and Conversion Summit. Amazing event. My friends over at Digital Market are running it, Ryan Dice and um, all of those guys. And it was just such an amazing event because I'd fly over there. There was no selling from stage, you know, like lots of the events over here where you're told to run to the back of the room and pay for the stuff you thought you were going to learn at the event that you just attended there was none of that. And I was just learning some amazing stuff and got to a point where I had to go every year because I'd get anxious if I didn't, because I've learned so much stuff that I could actually implement into my business to generate more leads, more sales. If I didn't go, I was like, okay, what am I missing out on? What's changed that I don't now know? And I just used to look at it and, and think, you know, why have I got to go all the way over to the States for this? Because it would cost me on average seven grand a year to go. I'd have to pay for my flight, my accommodation while I was out there, plus five days, six days away from the family grand for a ticket their tickets are grand minimum mm. three days and it was just because there was nothing like it over here and i probably took not only did i go back i think i've been like eight times now uh but i, I must have took 30 people at least in, in the years that i've been like my mates business partners things like that just and I, i've made them a bloody fortune and I, I looked at it and i thought what is it that they're doing that's that's getting me back and getting me to bring so many people and it was the fact that they had amazing speakers teaching actual strategies and tactics and not selling. Yeah. So you could just be comfortable. Plus it was great fun socially as well. The experience was great. You get to meet people, you know, lots of drinks, parties and all that sort of stuff. It was just great fun. So I just thought, you know, I just thought I'm going to, I'm going to try to build this over here. And uh, yeah, two years ago, literally two weeks before COVID, thank God we, uh, we did EMC one EMC 2020. We had 250 people sold it out the next year we were only allowed 350 the one you come to because of uh, covid we sold that out and this year we've got 750 at uh, london we're in london now 750 people and the whole the whole concept is you know experts teaching at well they're not they're not experts as a lot of people know them you know these guys all guys that 
sell courses and things like that, most of them run agencies like me. So I try to find guys really know what they're doing and then bring them in because they love me, basically. There's, there's just a load of favours, basically. I'm, I owe so many people favours now because they all speak of my stage for me. But their one goal is to is to teach them people an actual strategy, like an actual tactic. Do this, do that, do this, do that to get that. Not this is why you should do this. This is this is why. No, tell them how to do it, exactly how to do it. And um, the, our goal, it's literally printed off on our wall downstairs for EMC. Our goal is to make it so good that everyone in the room not only wants to come back next year, but they bring someone else with them. Yep. And even if they can't come next year, if they see one of my crazy ads for it next year, they tell their friends to go because they can't go. And that's it. And because we want to grow it. We want to get, we want to make it the home of entrepreneurs in the UK because I don't think that there's a place where entrepreneurs can get together, have, have, have obviously have learned a lot of stuff, you know, and learn some stuff from some great speakers, but also just get together and have a good time. So we, we put a lot of focus on the, the experience. You know, I've got a couple, I ain't going to spoil it for you, but we've got a couple of surprises this year. Um, we have a big party on day two where every, like everyone, this year be 750 people. We're clearing out the main room, you know, DJ comes on stage, bars come in and we have a big party and, and, and I wanted it to be like the home for entrepreneurs to, in the UK. I just want to say to as well, that, that is exactly how it feels. And I think the party is an important bit, which some people might think that's counterproductive, you know, everybody having a few beers and stuff like that. But for me, and it's just a personal preference. Not everybody will agree with this, but I cringe out big time with the events where people have got their business cards going, so what is it that you do? And it's kind of yeah. like people feel like they've got to put on an act and, and they've yeah. got to sell what they do. And for me, yeah. having a few beers at the time I was single, so talking about girls, talking about life and not selling who I am, just being authentic and being real, you make proper connections. And I think that's important because I believe, you know, the majority of people should be looking to start at least a side hustle or some kind of business, you know, some kind of income that they're, they're controlling to some degree. But when we go to a lot of these networking events and everybody's proper businessy, I think it puts people off. And I think a lot of people yeah. think, oh, I'm not like them. So this doesn't apply to me. The big thing I took, or one of the big things I took, is I just loved the vibe. Everybody that I spoke to, don't get me wrong, you're still going to get the old wanker with the card out. You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not yeah, for me, for sure. but, you know, yeah. but generally I just I just met some really good, genuine people and had some great conversations. Yeah, man. I mean, you hit the nail on the head with so many things then. Like, I agree. I, I, I know for a fact I can strike up. I can meet someone at, a, at an event, like in an event, in a more formal sort of environment, and we can get talking. You put me in a in a in a social environment with that person, he will be calling me up the next day because I'm his best friend on earth, you yeah. know. And 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 I know that's a fact for a lot of people because, like you said, people let their guard down a little bit. They socialise, and that's when real connections are made, yeah. not when they're putting up this front. It's when people are more relaxed. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get, introduce that more relaxed environment. But obviously through the day, you're going to learn some amazing stuff. You're going to want to let loose a little bit, you know, like, like a lot of these events over here in the UK that sell from stage, for example, where they do, you know, they'll, they'll pitch a load of stuff and, and all of that. They, they want you in the room all the time. They'll actually do stuff to get people in the room because they want as many people in the room as possible. Mm. You did we the opposite. We, we, we you literally the opposite. said, don't be in it all. Yeah, no, we don't want. I, I want the room sort of fifty percent full, uh, apart from the opening, uh, and for the headliners. You know, I want the room fifty percent full. And I say to people, look, if you don't want to learn about TikTok ads, we got a lady coming down that works at TikTok this year. If you don't want to learn about TikTok ads, don't learn about TikTok ads. If it's not gonna, if it's not actually gonna benefit your business, all it's gonna do is brain fry you. So go to the bar or go to the restaurants because again, it's at the O2. It's like you know, there's loads of stuff happening. Go there. And just sit down, catch on some emails, maybe strike up some more relationships of other people that are there. But don't like get, get yourself information overload. Just do the bits you want to do. Because again, they'll have a much better experience, which means they're probably more likely to come back. Yeah. Um, and that's the way we sort of structure the event. So yeah, yeah, I'm really chuffed you're coming, man. I can't wait to see you. We'll, uh, we'll, have, a, we'll have a few bevies when, when we're yeah. there. But, yeah. <laughs> and we won't talk about girls this time because I've got a missus. So <laughs> I'll leave that out. Um, so. Matt, yeah, that Matt, there's, uh, I'm just so grateful. There's so much you've shared already tonight and I'm mindful I want to make time for the members to do a bit of Q&A before 
uh, you go. I also just want to say um, I'm a massive fan of what you're doing. Everything we've just discussed there, you know, about leading with integrity, not all being salesy, putting relationships first and building genuine friendships, I think it's a huge thing for me, for business. Um, and I, it's great. EMC is the home for entrepreneurs and I'm, I'm, you know, privileged to be a guest there this year. Just before we finish up, last few questions. Um, for me, this podcast, this community success school, it's kind of the premise for me is about educating people on the things that school just generally didn't educate us on. So things like, you know, psychology, mindset, finances, business, health, well-being. And I'm interested, a, a question I like to ask all guests is as you reflect, have you got kind of, if you had to leave three lessons that you've learned that you didn't get taught in school that are important life lessons, what would be kind of the key lessons that you would share? Oh, cool. Quite a big question. You should, have, you should have preempted that one for me, so I could have thought about it for a few hours. Um, my main one, you know, main one is not to not to worry too much about what happens at school. Uh, it's, it's a real, real funny one because again, my son's just he's about to turn sixteen now, and uh, he's doing his mock exams, and um, he 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 was a bit nervous about his mock exams. And the message I sent to him was, you know, good luck on your exams. Please remember that it doesn't actually matter what happens in your exams, although your school's going to make you feel like it's the yeah. literally the, you know, be all and end all. It's actually not. Um, that's a big lesson. I think if I knew, if I knew that when I was younger, um, just that alone would have got me where I am now a lot quicker because I, I left school feeling like a failure. I left school feeling like, uh, well, that's it then. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't, I didn't get those A's. Mm -hmm. I, didn't even, I didn't get any B's or C's to be honest, but I didn't, I didn't get that. So that's it now, you know, yeah. and that's my life sort of laid out. So I wasted years doing stuff because I thought that's all I could do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it wasn't again until I started reading and learning about all of this other stuff that, uh, that I realized that you could do anything. So that's definitely one fitness, health, look after that without a doubt. You know, I really started looking after myself uh, about five years ago you know, my morning routine is very, very important to me. The difference in my day and my performance, if I if I don't do my morning routine, is crazy. I get up normally between five and six, I'll do 5K. Even if it's just a walk, I normally try to jog a lot of it. But even if it's just a walk, I walk 5K, get a nice little sweat on, listening to some motivational videos on YouTube, listening to some tunes. Then I go straight to the gym and I spend an hour in there lifting some weights. And that sets me up perfectly for the day. If I don't do that, the, my performance in the day is drastically, drastically different. Mm. And uh, I spent years not focusing on that at all. You know, and I used to think I worked hard and I used to think I did a lot, but I do 10 times in a day now what I used to do seven, eight years ago. And I do it quicker as well, which is crazy, yeah. you know? So it just, it just sorts out your focus. So that would be another big one for me. Um, and then, you know, yeah, lastly, just, yeah. I mean, you know, just do your best all the time. Do your best. Matt, thank you so much. If people want to connect with you online, follow you, all that kind of stuff, um, where is best, where can they find you? And also, um, EMC, anything about next year? Because when most people are going to listen to this, next week will have happened. Any info, any exclusives you can give us if people want to be at the next event? Yeah, so it's the 5th to the 7th of um, September 2023. Um, it's at the, the Greenwich again, the London, uh, it's at the Intercontinental at the O2. And the website will be www.emc2023.com. Um, and we're looking, we haven't announced or we haven't confirmed any speakers yet, but we're looking at Alex Hormozy I'm talking to right now. I don't know if lots of you, got, you guys know him. He could be a big speaker for us. So try, trying, to, trying to negotiate with him to get him over. He's never been to the UK to speak before. So that, that could be awesome. Ryan Dice, again, another really good marketer. Um, but that's all I know right now. I don't know yeah. any more than that right now, unfortunately. <laughs> and if people want to follow you online, where's the best place? Yeah, Matt, just Matt, just type in Matty Wilson, M-A-T-Y-W-I-L-S-O-N on, you know, Instagram, uh, YouTube, any of those.
Well, final question. You're definitely going to wish I prepped you on this one as well. So I'm, I'm just going to apologize in advance. But the final question I ask all guests, Matt, what is your personal definition of success? Uh, happiness. I measure it on how happy I am. Really, really simple as that. My, the, the most successful guy I know is my brother. My brother, Doug, is my youngest, young, not, not the youngest one, my third youngest brother. And he's a teacher. And he is so happy where he is right now, like genuinely. He loves his job. He goes to work and loves it, comes home, talks about it, has as much passion for it as I do with what I do, but it's a job. So he comes home, loves his fiance, got a house, got a dog, and he's just completely happy with where he is. And that's success to me. You know, I mean, it's very, very, it's, I envy that. I actually look at him and I look at other people that are like that as well. And I envy, envy where they're at because I, I can't settle like that, yeah. which it's not a bad thing, but it's not a good thing all the time as well, you know, because it means you're never going to, I'm never, I know for a fact, I'll never reach where I want to go because as soon as I get to a point, I want to go a bit further, but happiness as well, like making sure you're always happy. I measure how, how success, I, I, I'm more successful than uh, most of the millionaires I know because I love my family. I've got a great relationship with my kids. I have fun and live life. Like I go, I make it a point to experience stuff. I love going out with my friends. I love going to, I love music. I love going to music festivals and getting amongst it and just being around people and just having a fucking good time, you know? And, and that's what it's all about because I could die tomorrow. You know, I could die next week. I could die next year. And it's all about what you do while you're here, I think. And, and, and I, don't, I don't think people should put as much focus on money as, as they do. I used to want it when I was a bit younger, but then I just stopped, literally, I stopped wanting, you know, the flashy cars and all of that sort of stuff. I now just do it for experiences. I do it so that I can experience stuff with the people I love. Holidays, visiting places, again, festivals and things like that with friends and family, doing stuff you love with the people you love. Matt, thank you so much. Music to no my ears. Man. Absolutely brilliant. Guys, over to a bit of Q&A. As always, could you stop? And that is not the end of this episode because there was, I believe, around another 30 minutes Q&A that was had after this chat. Now, all you have to do if you want to listen to the rest of this episode is make sure you get your Success School membership. And if you haven't already, why have you not? It is completely free to come and join us on a 14-day try-before-you-buy trial. And after that, it's only £19 per month. And there are so many benefits you get once you become a member. You get to join our private WhatsApp accountability and support group. You get over 50 training videos around mindset, high performance, personal development, business branding, marketing, sales, and so much more. And you also get to be on all our Zoom podcast recordings where you can not only watch the podcast live, but then you can actually meet our guests, engage with them, and ask your questions to get personalized answers on the call. All you've got to do to sign up right now is click the links below this, whether you're listening on Apple Podcasts or whether you're watching on YouTube, the link is there in the show notes. Click that link. It'll take you probably 60 seconds to sign up, be a member, and you can literally continue with the rest of this podcast. But you will also get to join us immediately and get all those other benefits that I've just mentioned there as well. Just to be clear, it will ask for your payment details so that you can set up a proper account. But at the time of recording, there is still a 14-day free trial, so no money will be taken right now. You can can join us if you like it after 14 days at that point you know you can become a paying member click that link i will look forward to seeing you in there and thank you so much for being here for listening to this podcast episode i hope to see you next time but until then i will leave with the quote that i always do from famous thought leader mr jim rowan he said that traditional education will make you a living but self-education will make you a fortune i'll see you next time